yesterday with uh, suicide attempts finally decriminalized. What do you make of this? Very exciting. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning uh, to you and your cherished listeners. Um, well, it's really exciting news. In fact, it's one of the best news items uh, for me for the year. Uh, because we've been advocating for the decriminalization of attempted suicide all, all along. And we were getting resistance here and there, people thinking that, oh, if you, at, if you decriminalize it, it means you are giving the leeway for everybody to, to take his life, which was not mm. so. And so eventually, we are happy that two members of parliament themselves championed the decriminalization agenda, and eventually you've got it through. So we are really, really excited. I we think it's a way forward for the country, is a way forward for persons with mental illness, because frankly, anybody who attempts suicide, the chance 93, 95 percent are that the person has a mental health issue. Mm. And it is that which forces the person to want to take his life. And if such a person, thank God, does not succeed in taking his life, then you want to punish him. It means you want to punish him for he developing mental illness, which is just not right. Mm. And, and so we know that henceforth anyone who does attempt suicide will be considered to be suffering or living with or afflicted with some severe mental disorder and thus provided with some mental health care. How equipped are we as a nation to deal deal with mental health problems? Because we know that there are uh, infrastructural challenges, monetary challenges. The budget allocated to mental health is simply not adequate. So what is the way forward? Yeah, challenges there are. And uh, there's a problem in Chi that will be anywhere in other words, uh, nobody prepares for a journey, and he has made 100% preparation. So here and there, there will be gaps there, but even the gaps allow us to um, know how to move forward. Right. Even malaria, it's not everybody who has malaria who gets treated, uh, but we have structures in place to treat malaria. So in the same way, yes, now the situation is much improved for mental health care. There was a time there were only about a four psychiatrists, and we are talking about 64 psychiatrists. So 64, you say, Prof? Sorry? You, you said 64. 64. That's, that's a four, great improvement. A lot of, lot of improvement. That's against some four in some 15 years ago. Uh, now, mental health services are, are available everywhere in the country. Wherever you treat malaria, including even chips, compound, you can have your mental health care assessed and treated, mm. at least to a certain degree. And then if you require further care, then you'll be forwarded. So it's available. Personnel, the 64, we are not spread everywhere, but there are other staff, psychiatric nurses, and clinical psychologists, and uh, even general health practitioners have also been given some basic training in mental health care, so they can provide some basic services. So mm. anybody with attempted suicide is considered by the law, the new law, is considered to be mentally ill. It doesn't necessarily mean you have mental illness at all costs, but it means you need to be evaluated for mental illness. And if you have, then you are treated. Mm. Now, for, for those of us who want more knowledge, who want more education, what are the things that you would say, the reasons that contribute to people having poor mental health or going through mental health disorders we know that for some people it's just i guess the brain chemistry but what other factors would you say are contributing greatly to uh, the mental health issues that face Ghanaians today brain chemistry as you said uh, there, there are imbalances in the chemicals in the brain that is the bottom line but other factors may push one to get to that situation so various factors that may push the person to that situation where they may be imbalanced in the chemicals, we include stress. So if you go through a lot of stress in life and you are not able to find a way of resolving your stress, you can be pushed into mental illness. Uh, you have, let's say, you've lost a dear one through death, and then you think so deeply about it, you, uh, you, it's difficult for you to be consoled. Going through the grief, the grief can lead to mental illness. Or you've lost a dear one through separation, boyfriend, girlfriend, a divorce, a husband, wife, and the thought about that can push one into mental illness. You have lost the capital. 
you are a trader, you are working, and all your capital is lost, or maybe as you are going across uh, Togo, and then in between robbers or whatever, so you lose your capital, the thought of it can put you into mental disorders. Childbirth, somebody goes through childbirth, labor, and mm. the trauma of the labor and the chemicals associated with the labor can push somebody into mental disorder. They call that postpartum depression. Somebody encounters a traumatic situation in which you could have died, or you saw people actually dying, and then he survives. Then anytime he thinks about it, it turns with some flashes in his mind, mm. memory, and, and we call this post-traumatic stress disorder. So all these right. are factors. And uh, finally, I would say, among the numerous other factors, uh, is drug abuse. We use mm. cocaine, heroin, that also causes mental disorder through distorting the balance in, in the brain chemicals. Now, Prof, if a ranking system does exist, I'm not sure if one does, would you be able to say what the topmost reason is or in your line of work where you sit, what would you say is the biggest reason, if that's possible to quantify? Yeah, uh, uh, for youth, young men, adolescents, mm. drug abuse. Is drug a abuse. Major cause. Okay. Drug abuse. For women, relationship problems giving rise to depression mm. is a major contributory factor. Right. Okay. There are also there are also hereditary factors anyway, like the big disorder schizophrenia. Mm. Hereditary factors are also a contributory factor. Right. A lot for us to contend with. But Prof, given the also the economic climate, would you say you are seeing a rise in mental health challenges because of the issues that businessmen and women are faced with? And even the ordinary citizen increase in utility bills, the cost of living just being too high. Does that have a direct impact on the state of affairs as concerns mental health in Ghana? It does have. It does have. In fact, there is a relationship between mental illness and poverty. So mm. Anything that pushes one into poverty, uh, socioeconomic uh, factors in the country, uh, personal circumstances, anything that pushes anybody in down the uh, socioeconomic level can uh, develop into mental illness. For poverty, there is a relationship. Uh, as you say, somebody goes to work, you have your monthly salary at the end of the month. Within one week or even two, three days, your salary is gone. And you begin to think, when next? My child will go to school, my wife will need to go to market. So the thought of it can push people into mental illness. So, yes, there is there is there is an increase or uh, yeah, in mental illness as a result of all this. Now, Prof, just before I, I let you go, what about society as a whole? What can we be doing better or what should we stop doing to ensure that we don't exacerbate the, the, the problem? We've talked this morning, myself and, and my colleague William, about even the language that we use to describe mental health disorders. But if you can expand on that, what should society be doing to support people who are going through mental health challenges? One, uh, what should we do even to prevent ourselves from getting mental illness? We need mm. to recognize that challenges are there everywhere. Uh, Social economic factors are there everywhere. But our own resilience is very important. Our own resilience, our coping mechanism. We need to be able to cope with circumstances that come away. And the coping mechanism could include discussing your issues with a colleague, with a friend, with an elder, with your church elder, or any elderly person. Or if it comes so far, then seeking professional counseling, professional um, advice. So that becomes your coping mechanism. That is very important to prevent mental illness because that's for challenges. They are there everywhere, every time. So that becomes very important. Hmm. And then uh, if somebody gets mental illness, what can the society do to support him? That is also very important. The language you use, as you said, and this I must uh, say, unfortunately, the media becomes corporate. The this is true. Language they use in their reportage, um, even committed suicide is a wrong reportage, wrong terminology. What is the right way to, to report something like that? He has taken his life or he has died through suicide. Now, the reason is that committed suicide, obviously, you commit something get wrong. So, committed suicide means you've done something wrong. But as we've explained earlier, if somebody takes his life or wants to take his life, it is not a crime, but a mental health issue. And so you want, don't want to encourage that language by being committed to it, but rather taking his life. And then uh, other things, so that's a lunatic, that's an imbecile. That mm. is definitely derogatory. So you should avoid... What about lunatic. words such as, this person is crazy, this person is mad? 
definitely. Those are wrong. Those are right. wrong. If you are using maybe in the course of uh, like you and I are, are talking, we are playing mm. and say, oh, you are crazy. That one obviously has a different connotation. Sure. But referring to his mental illness, you say he's crazy, he's mad, definitely is derogatory. So any description that is derogatory goes against the person with mental illness and it it it, it, it puts him down and eventually worsens his plight. Indeed, even describing him as schizophrenic, depressed, or depressive, that is self-stigmatizing. Mm. So don't describe somebody with his condition, but he is first and foremost a person. So he's a person with mental illness rather than a mentally ill person. So language is very important. And then uh, the stigma that we associate with mental illness generally, somebody goes to a psychiatric hospital, or he goes to see a psychiatric for a psychologist, and he comes back and he, course, he points fingers at the person. Then it means that next time he has a mental illness, you go to the hospital, or you didn't seek for help, but that becomes stigmatized. But let's embrace them. If I go to Kolebo for pneumonia or TB or anything, and I come back, you'll embrace me with love. In the same way, you want to embrace me with mental illness who have been to the hospital or who have gone to treatment. So these are things we can use to support persons with mental illness. And now, lastly, I know I said that was my last question, but also the influence of religion in our part of the world as well. If you can speak to that very briefly for us. Um, Sometimes our first point of call when we think somebody is going through a mental crisis is to take them to the church or a religious leader, to a shrine even, if you will, depending on what your religious um, uh, inclinations are. What do you make of that? Do we we say people should divorce religion from this uh, type of situation or... Do they do it in tandem with mental health help, professional help? Religion has an interesting relationship with mental health issues. Uh, religion both does contribute to mental illness and does relieve mental illness. So it, it goes both ways. Mm. Now, so what I mean is that people who are religious tend to be resilient in terms of mental illness because. You, you tend to see beyond what is happening to you and it gives you some hope. And the hope becomes an element, becomes part of the coping mechanism. Remember, you said coping mechanism is very important, it gives you resilience. Mm. So, religiosity becomes a coping mechanism and that is good. On the other hand, religion also tends to rob people of their rationality, sense of rationality. And that becomes very dangerous, especially mm. the pastors will indoctrinate you. This that is going, you are going through, uh, the dream you had, the, especially wet dreams, the wet dream you had, it's a, it's a spiritual possession, some evil spirits after you, your aunt, your grandma, they are witches after you. It tells you what's not applied. It tells you to push a whole lot of things, believe wrong, believe in our mind, that can even transmit it or worsen mental illness. So, uh, pastors need to be careful in terms of what we feed our patients or our clients with. Now, if somebody has a mental illness, to me, the first place to go is not to the prayer camp. Right. Go to the hospital. And then, at the hospital, support it to your, uh, with, with your prayers. So, if it's, let's say, your brother or your sister who has mental illness, take the person to the for treatment, the academy for law or general hospital, and then you support with prayers. You don't always have to be in the presence of the person praying to get your help. You said you don't, you don't always have to touch people before they got their health. So you can always pray for somebody who is at a hospital and it will equally be effective. But to substitute orthodox care for uh, with a, 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 a prayer center care and then they put them in chains and whatnot, that obviously becomes bad. Indeed, if we are really fully implementing the mental health care, anybody who puts anybody in chains would have committed already a crime mm. and the person can be jailed for five years, ten years. And or that's important to know. Anybody with mental illness has committed a crime. Mm. Or anybody who has given the advice of a person with mental illness has committed a crime. Well, thank you so much for that, Prof. Thank you for your time this morning and for giving us more insight into this very important matter. You are welcome. And that was Professor Akwesi Osei, former CEO of Mental Health Authority. He also advocated against the criminalization of attempted suicide and it's a, he said this is a step in the right direction he does say that uh, mental health care has come a long way 
in the country. He says from four uh, institutions to about 64 where one can seek help. I think that is great news and a step in the right direction. We wanted to know what are the leading causes. He talks about drugs amongst young men and with women uh, issues of the demise of a interpersonal or romantic relationship causing depression and also uh, one thing he also mentioned that i think is important is language well let me mention language and i think we all have to think about that uh, as well when we when we um talk about mental health also uh religion i know religion is a big thing religion is a big thing as well and it's a double-edged sword and i think that is also important to highlight he says for some people um it's the one thing that gives them comfort gives them the assurance that they can get through the issues but for others it causes some some something different an irrationality if you will but we're grateful for prof's uh, time and insight on the matter uh, we're going to get into some exciting matters now as i mentioned this morning we're going to be getting our dancing shoes on the 